thank you for joining us in this uh, session that I, I honestly, I'm excited to have because we've never had a session on, on gender specifically uh, at the GIFT uh, network. And we actually do have very interesting experiences going on in the network. Um, we have encouraged some, some moments of sharing of peer exchange from uh, um, mainly about uh, gender budgeting. And so today we have uh, the presentation of two new gender budgets that have recently been launched and that's in Colombia and Argentina. We're going to have a broader overview of how gender budgeting is happening in the world and specifically in OECD countries and OECD countries plus uh, with Andrew Blasey from the OECD. We're going to have also uh, the presentation of some studies around how it we can have a gender lens on contracting, which makes it as a tool also for, for improving gender balance. Um, and then we're going to have the presentation of two so civil society organizations that are working on this subject in a very different way with different approach, but both very um, interesting uh, that I think it's, it's worth seeing here. Um, Finally, from OGP, we will have the presentation of some, some cases in which um, gender and fiscal openness start to intersect, which one of them is a, a good example is also in Colombia happening now, but uh, they have some examples from all around the world. So thank you all for joining. Oh, we have Andrew here. So if our presenters have video and can uh, have it on, that would be great because then we can see you very well. Um, thank you for some of the organizations that first uh, we were suffering with the gender balance of this gender session, but uh, you finally uh, all came up with uh, additional presenters. Thank you for that. Uh, we think this is also very important and I am very glad that you are presenting today. So first off, and now that we have Andrew here, thank you, we're gonna start as the lineup was set up. So we're gonna start with the OECD with Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorena, and uh, great to be uh, back here after just uh, being in the earlier meeting on uh, FMIS. Um, Hey, this is a super important topic uh, for us, and so I'm delighted to be able to uh, be here and talk to it uh, today. I've got a few slides. Uh, I, I'm going to keep them uh, short, and uh, uh, we'll just share those with you with you now. Uh, one that. Thanks. And. There we go. Okay, uh, so I'm going to uh, just run through briefly um, uh, a little bit about how uh, we organise ourselves uh, in thinking about uh, gender budgeting and uh, fiscal transparency uh, here at the OECD, uh, and and with that uh, how it's used. Uh, then to dive into a few country examples uh, and to finish with a with a few uh, a few resources. Um, so this, this starting point with the framework, uh, uh, there's no one uh, framework, obviously, it's, uh, uh, but this is one that we use uh, that looks at uh, uh, the strategic context, the, the tools to implement that strategy, and uh, most importantly, whether there's a supportive and enabling environment for that to take place uh, for, for gender uh, budgeting and, and gender-related issues. Uh, knowing that this is a, a, a tool or a approach that helps contribute towards gender equality uh, generally. Uh, and this slide here, I've gone with each of these uh, uh, three elements just to put some illustrations in here to go, you know, a strategic framework is about the political leadership and commitment, about having a strategy to express that commitment. 
and the whole of government approach that this applies uh, applies to everyone. On tools, a bit about a, a statement in terms of again leadership, uh, gender impact analysis to show that this can occur ex ante uh, and can be ahead of policy implementation, as well as during a budget such as tagging uh, data. Uh, or ex post uh, uh, in terms of baseline uh, review of, uh, of, of gender uh, policy and gender impacts. Uh, a supportive environment, uh, some, of them, some of the mechanical things you'd expect to see like guidance and training, but also very importantly that there's oversight uh, and accountability about that, that occurring so that there is, is some follow through uh, on it. Across the OECD's 37 uh, members, uh, you can see that just a little over half are undertaking uh, gender budgeting. Uh, uh, with a couple there, France and Turkey, uh, giving it under consideration. These figures are actually from 2019, uh, and I understand uh, France and certainly has gone ahead uh, since then. Uh, and that this is a way of uh, uh, not only is gender, uh, uh, gender issues important in themselves, but they're also the start of a lens into a, a deeper appreciation of policy impacts. Because after looking at gender, you get into gender youth, gender elderly, gender poverty, or gender indigenous people, uh, and really start to bring the policy variables alive through a very fundamental lens of, of, a, of a gender perspective. And so uh, as I move into some of the country examples, I think uh, it, it helps show how that, that's taking place as well. Now, with these examples, uh, I've gone and just randomly chosen uh, two OECD countries and two non-OECD countries. There's no particular uh, logic to this. Uh, anyone who's feeling left out can speak up uh, uh, during, this, during this session. Uh, I really just wanted to uh, pull out a couple um, uh, of uh, examples of, uh, of where we've enjoyed working with people and where there's, there's progress that, that uh, is very, very evident. With, uh, with Iceland, uh, you know, we held a, a gender budgeting uh, webinar in, in June and uh, Iceland presented at that with some of its um, progress. Uh, really exciting because they had applied it uh, to responses to COVID-19. So this is incredibly current. Uh, and the thing I liked about it, you know, when Iceland already has gender budgeting and, and reporting well in place, uh, was the use of gender impact analysis uh, that was contributing to the design of response measures to COVID uh, and being included in the budget bill that was, was put forward to the parliament. This was super, uh, uh, super valuable because there are some things such as public investment and the call to fast track infrastructure where the gender impacts are significant in that uh, Iceland estimated that some 85 to 90% of jobs would go to men uh, in terms of the construction industry and some of the imbalances that uh, weren't necessarily apparent when calling for action, but were gonna be apparent in terms of how that action was followed through upon. What I really like about this, though, from a transparency uh, and fiscal reporting perspective, though, is that it shows that this was really mainstreamed into Iceland's uh, um, uh, public sector for it to be applied like this. It wasn't about starting off, it was about uh, how they already had things in place and were uh, using those in relation to the, uh, and to the crisis. Ireland, look, Ireland, uh, I'm going to have to speed it up a bit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get told off for taking too long. Uh, but Ireland is really, what I like here with my four, these four bullet points is that it shows a very classic top-down approach. You know, a big picture, high political priority, a national strategy for women and girls that, that was uh, put in place in 2017. So that political commitment was expressed. Uh, a strong institutional framework that not only is it through the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, through an evaluation agency, but also uh, through the Human Rights and uh, Equality Commission in terms of independent institutional arrangements as well, a raft of analytical tools and sitting beneath that some data uh, disaggregation too. So you know, going from the highest level through to, to data, it is a very clear picture with Ireland, which I think makes it a, a brilliant example. Moving to two other, other countries, Argentina, uh, uh, 
going to allow uh, um, Gustavo uh, Marino, who's talking later, to correct me for anything I get wrong or, or I don't go into enough detail on. Uh, but uh, was working with um, Argentina last year on a review of budgeting. Uh, absolute pleasure uh, to work with and to see that things like a gender, gender budget statement were in place. Uh, and, and I think one of the standouts for me was that the OPC, the Congressional Budget uh, uh, Office, uh, has a formal responsibility in its legislation for gender budgeting in terms of an independent body to follow through on that, on transparency. Uh, and uh, I think uh, why I've put the UN Gender Development Index on there is that Argentina scores really well, and it scores really well compared to an OECD average. Uh, on it, and, and I think, you know, uh, some things where there are successes and they're reported upon, it's really worth shouting out uh, about them. Uh, finally, example with Thailand, also working with Thailand last year on a review of budgeting, and Thailand requested that we do a supplementary piece of work to produce an action plan on gender budgeting. Uh, and they have a, a gender responsive approach. They've expressed it in legislation. They also have a, a non-discrimination clause in their national constitution. Uh, and as of, of this year for the 2020 budget, uh, any budget requests going through to their, their budget bureau had to be accompanied by a gender impact analysis in terms of, of uh, introducing that as a standard requirement so that the, the information was there to then follow through onto their, onto their reporting. Uh, again, really encouraging uh, and encouraging developments. Uh, where do you learn more about this without having to listen to me? Uh, uh, resources are the um, OECD website has a, not only a framework, but a very practical guide on designing and implementing uh, gender budgeting, along with a good uh, set of comparison analysis uh, on OECD countries. You can see more detail on the scan that we did with Ireland, more detail on the action plan with Thailand, and a uh, 2019 publication that really talks a lot, not only about uh, a feature with gender budgeting, but about fiscal transparency in general and the way in which uh, countries have moved forward on that across the, the 37 um, OECD members. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you for the, the privilege of being able to take part in this session, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing the other presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and I am regretting that we only have one hour because this is a, a, an important conversation. Um, York, one of the things that I just really wanted to highlight on the case of Andrew before we go to, to, to you, Jörg, is I have seen some gender budgeting, some uh, new ones in, in certain countries that they are only tagging and changing the, the budget activity into gender. But what happens with these intersectionalities of gender plus elderly plus childhood? And I think you um, highlighted this in the Iceland case very well. And it's a very important thing. I, this is actually the case in, in, in Uruguay. I'm glad uh, Paula is coming up. I, I'm going to have uh, make time for questions, Jörg. The floor is yours. I, no, sorry. Um, we're going with Andy first. Thanks, Lorena. Go ahead, and so th th thanks for the, the opportunity to talk about our um, uh, our research and and um, thinking really hard about you know what's the role of women businesses in in public procurement is one of the areas where you know there's a lot of economic activity going on and, and what are the questions that that we look at. So Andy Andy and I are going to present um, uh, latest research that we've done and a, and a quick case study from the Dominican Republic. So um, I'll, I'll have Andy sort of like pull up a quick presentation and then and then she'll walk us through. Thank you, Lorena. All right, thank you, Georg, and thank you, Lorena. Um, can everyone see my screen? We can. Okay, excellent. So thanks again for this opportunity to talk about the subject area that we in Open Contracting Partnership are actually very passionate about gender. So um, recently we launched the report 
working with um, Value for Women, together with Value for Women, we set out to investigate what exactly were the challenges that women faced in public procurement and the emerging practices that would help to promote fairness and inclusion. So today I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of what we are findings in this report and certain recommendations before I hand over to my colleague Georg. So thinking around what barriers um, women-led businesses face in public procurement, the first thing I like to touch on here is that the barriers are not solely for women-led businesses, but this challenge is caught across both, um, is faced by both women-led businesses and challenges also faced by women in governments that are reformers in public procurement. Some of these barriers found during the research are that um, include these, that it is difficult to actually identify what a woman-led woman business is. Also, women reported negative perceptions about the openness and fairness of public pro pro procurement processes. And then we also found that women entrepreneurs had a lack of access to finance due to discriminatory practices. And that women lead by far more in small businesses than large ones. And this hinders their capacity to meet the requirements of large government contracts. Well, it does not end there. We also found that gender norms and assigned roles actually translate into greater time restrictions for women. So women end up, um, and this has a negative impact on women's self-confidence to chase after a public contract. And essentially, they are under-recognized and undervalued as women. Also, corruption and bias have impaired the fairness of public procurement processes for women. And another thing we found was that there was a lack of knowledge of tender opportunities because the information was not brought about in a timely manner. And finally, many procurement officials actually lack formal feedback loops and even informal feedback loops to get information of how they can engage and act on feedback that they receive from their business community. So we didn't stop there. We thought about the recommendations that um, we could put together, we could think around having addressed the barriers that women are facing. And the first thing we thought was that we need to actually define what a woman-led business means in each person's context, and then identify women-led businesses in the data from procurement systems and from company registers in different countries. Also, we thought it was necessary to make a commitment to gender equality and to develop a strategy for gender responsive procurement, including capacity building opportunities. We also found that it is necessary to publish information about the planning, tender, award, contract, and implementation of public contracts, that's the entire contracting process, to demystify the process and empower businesses with access to information. The fourth recommendation we made was that we think there should be a simplification of the application procedures and tender requirements by streamlining and standardizing tender documentation and pre-qualification procedures. Next, we thought that ensuring prompt payments can actually give women-led businesses more confidence to bid. And that if businesses are not paid on time, that they may have difficulty getting access to bridge financing. That was our reasoning behind this particular recommendation. And also, we thought um, to facilitate the creation of a gender-responsive public procurement market by engaging um, different stakeholders, and that way increasing our supplier capacity. And finally, we saw that there was a need for an inclusive entrepreneurship ecosystem and that we could nurture this by generating spaces for the joint development of initiatives that strengthen women's entrepreneurship and support gender responsive procurement programs. So at this point, I'll hand over to my colleague, Georg, so um, he can give the case study. Georg, do you want to go ahead and present your own screen? I, I would love to, yes. Um, I, no, I'll, I'll, okay. use, I'll use your, I'll use your um, presentation and I might be able to move it myself as well. Um, or uh, okay. to move it. So I think um, you know the, this this report has been really helpful um, with a lot of exp um, um, case studies from Latin America specifically, and and we've talked to experts in the region um, and globally 
to really understand what what was behind that and you know one of the things that that comes across and i think that that really matters is that if you look at you know it, it, and that's where we start with the case study as well is that in many cases you know women owned businesses make up um up to uh in the us for example run 27 percent of all business but only a tiny percent about five percent actually get contracts in the sector that uh, women businesses are most represented as the small and medium sector, um, that percentage is even higher, you know, up to up to 60, 70 percent is uh, women run, but contracts don't um, don't follow. So here's what the Dominican Republic has done to really think about how they can um, improve that percentage. And as you've seen, they've been successful, especially in, in smaller contracts to um, you know, provide, uh, you know, contracts in the value of six billion, um, billion, in billion dollars to $42 million in, in 2019. So um, here's what they've done. And Andy, if you can, if you can move that slide quickly. Um, they've looked at four key areas. One is really increased participation um, of women businesses in the procurement process by um, doing some uh, you know, things as simple as, you know, how do you sell to the state? And sorry, this is in Spanish. Um, we'll have a, a, a translated version uh, coming soon. Um, and how do you sort of like sell to the state? Um, really uh, sort of like business networks directed at, um, at women, women businesses. So really understanding where they're coming from, what their needs are and what they can offer. Um, so in terms of tools, what they've started to build is they've um, they've started to create lists um, to their procurement um, officials and to the different agencies that um, gave them, you know, uh, basically a, a listing of um, of who can do and provide what, you know, which is something where you think like, well, you know, I do, I only know my friends who do um, uh, business, but they shouldn't uh, award contracts in this way as well. But that's you know um, just sort of like this this idea. Um, so they've created these kinds of lists um, and they've also um, sort of like pulled down the information of like what kind of businesses are available. So both lists for the different kinds of products and services that are available, but also understanding what are the um, um, kind of um, understanding of what, how much money is being spent currently so that they can actually measure it. So if you don't measure it, you can't really count it. Um, Kurt, I'm and sorry, but one, I need you to wrap up. <laughs> perfect. I only have two more points to say, which is the important part here is on data. So really using that data that they've developed to actually create indicators. Um, so you need indicators um, to, um, to increase those numbers. And finally, it's, it's not just about um, individual actions. There needs to be institutional change. Um, so they've um, really sort of like expanded that from one central agency to working in different uh, within the regions in the Dominican Republic and um, and beyond so that they can work there with SMEs um, and uh, that was that was really a very quick summary of the Dominican Republic and you know you can learn more in our blog and uh, a short and a long report depending on how much time you have um, so you have the graphic there you have the report in the middle and then obviously we do much more on uh, women um, on, on gender and inclusiveness and procurement, but that was the part that we felt was really helpful in, in this point. I uh, really like the framework because it's not just about give, it's not give contracts to women, it's change the whole strategy and structure. Uh, so that's a uh, very good. I would like to give a lot of comments about this because it's a great framework, uh, but for the sake of the time and open questions for all the public, we're going to pass to the next blog. We're going to see two uh, different ge uh, gender budgeting practices in different countries. So we now have Marcela Numa from the Budget Office of Colombia. They just recently launched their gender budget and we have been glad to be to have seen the progress and all this this process so marcela over to you i think leonardo is sharing his screen así es buenos días tardes para todos o noches good morning good afternoon and good evening like you said lorena 
We have recently implemented a gender budget. Leonardo, could you assist me with the presentation, please? Let me know if you can see the presentation on the screen. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, next. So this process has been going on since last year. And we began in February and March last year, looking to build this uh, gender equity tracer or tracker with participation, not just by state entities, but also we had the opportunity to share an International Day of Open Data with a number of uh, organizations. And this activity helped us to develop the lines of action that we were going to work on. We listened to organized civil society organization on the issue of women and what they were hoping from the government um, to be able to address the issue of gender and what we all hope, which is to close the gap between men and women in society. This was an important event. We can go ahead and move to the next slide. And because our development, national development plan, which is of course the roadmap for the government, included a very important task, which is to develop a budget tracker to be able to plan and follow up on mainstreaming policy in this case, or, or cross-cutting policies in this case, gender equity. So with the inputs that we got from the events at the beginning of the year, we were able to launch our document in March of last year. And with the help of GIFT, we were able to analyze a number of international cases. And we reviewed each of these cases. And to do that, we had a lot of virtual meetings with colleagues from other countries. And of course, we had even more input about how we should build this tracker tool. And that, of course, is part of our uh, sustainable development goals as well. So we conceptualize what categories of spending we wanted to look at specifically and measure. And so we had trainings with state sectors and with all the principal sectors and actors. Our budget system uh, it happens in two departments in the country. One is in the national planning department, and also the Ministry of the Treasury, or finance, sorry. And the finance uh, ministry looks at the expenditures. And of course, we have to look at the recurring expenditures in administration as well. So the national planning department, uh, when we were putting together the draft proposals, we, they were able to say which of these particular proposals had to do with our gender strategy and what expenditures were to go specifically to closing the gap between men and women in each one of the institutions. With this in mind, we follow these clear lines of action. And they are the following, economic autonomy, access to assets, participation in power, uh, scenarios and decision-making spaces, health and sexual, reproductive sexual rights, education and access to new technologies, and a life free of violence. These are our major uh, focuses in the gender equity tracking. And what we did was to ask each of the entities in their, uh, in what aspects of their budget was dealing with this. And we did this exercise with the Council for Equity 
uh, the Budget Council for Equity for Women, uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, Planning, Presidential Council for Women's Equity, and we looked at what was budgeted in 2020, and that became a document that was available to citizens in general, and all of you, if you want to look at it, we were able to see what was done in 2019 and what's planned for 2020. This information was also important input and part of all of the documentation that goes to the Congress of the Republic. So there is the draft budget for 2021 and but line item by line item, you can see um, what policy that particular line item is related to and how much money has been assigned to it. So this has been very important uh, piece of information and that uh, draft budget for 2021 is also available in this link here. This is part of what we were already able to deliver. We've identified the line items, the various categories, how much investment, how much for functioning, and each peso is accounted for in programming. So these are the results of the whole uh, budgetary cycle for 2021. As I said, we were able to turn all over, over these documents to the Congress and we had the opportunity to show them officially to the Congress because there's a commission called for a commission for gender equity. And Monday last week when we were op doing the opening event for this week, I had to leave early because I was participating in this event. So this uh, presentation is super recent. Uh, what I can say is that the commission loved this information and it helps them to have very clear information about what uh, budget items are going to be allocated. And the idea is during the rest of the year, um, the men and women who work on the commission it's an intersectorial commission and bicameral, both the House and the Senate, and um, it's the Commission on Gender Equity or Equity for Women. And there was a, a bunch of ex, uh, expectations of what's going to be done in the rest of the year, workshops and seminars. And it, I'm very proud to say that the information we were able to uh, give to them is going to be very useful and is going to have some concrete uh, results for the rest of the year. So what's in the future for the tracker? We have, the idea is to give information uh, in the framework of the commission and to have good indicators that will help us not only to see what the quantity of the resources are, but for what and what is being spent. So what comes with the tracker? All of these meetings that we're going to do in the framework of the Commission on Women and also uh, with the help of academia, we're going to be able to do these uh, workshops. We're working on open data with open data to be able to get, get that information up. And we have our very pending for what civil society organizations are asking for on this topic. And of course, it's because of them that we were able to do all of this work. So that's what I wanted to be able to share with you. I hope I haven't uh, gone over my time. Marcella, thank you so much. What I really like about this example is that it's an example 
of participation in the design and development of the process and it, that it's open to improving also with more participation. And that's great, not just for the report, but for immediate use. Thank you so much, Marcela. Yes, it's very happy to do so. No, really, thank you very much for allowing us to show uh, our case study. Uh, but we do feel proud that we were able to do a lot in a short period period of time, because we just started last year and we already have a lot of information. So I think it's gone very well. Yeah, a very, very short time. And you were able to orient the objective, which was something that wasn't mentioned either. Gustavo? Bueno. Let's go to Argentina tal, now. Eh, soy Gustavo Great. My Merino, name is Gustavo eh, vamos Merino. A hablar un poquito de and we're going to talk a little bit about methodology. Eh, estamos empleando para identificar, the methodology eh, that we're using to eh, identify que a las de budget actions and that contributes to gender equity. I'm going to share si the bien. screen here. Estamos bien ahí, ¿no? Sí. Bueno. sí. Fantástico. Bueno, lo voy a hacer lo más rápido posible, Lorena, pero pido por favor cualquier cosa me va a parar. Bueno, la idea era eh, cómo podíamos hacer para encarar el desafío de, eh, de poder estimar el presupuesto dedicado a políticas de género. Eh, lo encaramos como un desafío de modelo de gestión pública, donde se planifican las políticas, se gestionan y se rinde cuentas. Eh, obviamente, evaluando y midiendo para eh, administrar y tener que ser accountable. Estas políticas públicas tienen su correlato financiero en el presupuesto. Pero son dos herramientas que conviven. Por un lado tenemos el plan, que serían las políticas públicas, donde el plan es estratégico, And we have in the uh, cross-cutting, medium-term vision un, for the plan, de corto but plazo, the budget de is more short-term for the budget cycle, and it has to do more Porque with financial management and has kind of a vertical digamos, vision because it's oriented to institutions that are uh, running different programs. No sentido, so if you had a plan without a budget, it wouldn't make any sense, right? Tampoco if you had a budget and no plan, that wouldn't make sense either. Because um, you would have a risk of inefficiency. So the budget is a tool for public policy expressed in the plan and, making, and putting that into action. Bueno, nosotros tuvimos, We, gracias a nuestra participación en el quinto plan de gobierno abierto, una creciente en relación work. con We've had a growing de la sociedad civil, de la civil society. y ahí la veo a Carmen, que seguramente nos va a compartir Carmen here, lo que ellos están haciendo, share what they're donde doing. una de las primeras preguntas que nos, que nos hacían era, bueno, yo quiero ver el presupuesto de género, us, okay, eh, o el presupuesto de niñez, o el presupuesto de la realidad, uh, no existen clasificadores presupuestarios, o sinceros, We don't have classifications specifically for spending money on various groups of people, so we had to do something. We have a budget, results-based budget. Programación física, so there's a lot o sea, de programación de la ejecución física, qué se va a hacer con ese financiamiento. Y por otro lado, también estábamos intervenidos por los and objetivos de sostenible, que también son transversales. Pues a partir de esto, so, given y teniendo that, en cuenta eh, que nosotros tenemos un presupuesto por programa, sabemos que los programas presupuestarios son los que expresan cómo se producen los bienes y servicios para la sociedad. To see, um, paso rápido para it, llegar. expresses eh, how goods no and services teníamos, are produced for society. No tenemos, y, so y ahora since trato de explicar por qué no tenemos clasificadores presupuestarios que sean utilizados para estos análisis transversales, porque hay muchos análisis transversales que se superponen. Por eso puse estas flechitas acá como que um, se juntan. Yeah, it's Porque because muchos, things eh, are, digamos, there's a lot of overlap, que there's a lot of policies that, pro that contribute to children and to um, disabled people and to women, and so it's estas, very hard estas, to separate the administrative uh, work that is 
going to any of these groups. So if we're talking about scholarships, for example, it's very hard for the person who's operating the system to say, so how much is going for scholarship for young people? How much for women? How much for young women? How much for young women with disabilities? So that's impossible, but we have to figure out how to tag the programmatic uh, line items to see how they uh, contribute to our cross-cutting goals. So the national administration entities that work together with the budgeting office use financial administration systems that we have developed. And to do that, what we did was five activities to systematize the cross-cutting analysis. First of all, we tag or label each line item to talk about what are the programmatic categories uh, go to these cross-cutting, and, and we wait, and we, we wait them according Después, to the estimated ley, expenditures. Secondly, in the bills, um, we have a email, sorry, we have a web page called Open digamos, Budgeting. It's basically the free budget and the participatory space, and they talk specifically about what's being allocated to the cross-cutting priorities. Third, in our um, Open Budgeting site, we have quarterly reports about the progress and execution of these cross-cutting analyses. And we publish that also with open data, and we have a system of business intelligence where we're developing a way to help people in the National Budgeting and Analysis Office to look at these cross-cutting themes. Uh, the tagging is Identifican, identifican o traten de identificar cuáles de las categorías programáticas van aportando en este caso de género y la Oficina Nacional de Presupuesto hace como un análisis de ese etiquetado y le da el ok. Entonces la apertura programática queda etiquetada y de alguna manera ponderada. Este es un proceso interactivo que seguramente va a tener errores al principio y se va a ir refinando con el correo de los estas son las pantallas del sistema donde ah, se definen las políticas las temáticas transversales y se asocian las temáticas a, a distintas aperturas programáticas. Esto para que vean que nosotros hemos sistematizado todo esto porque el darle para obtener una sosten sostenibilidad so en la publicación de la información necesitamos que esté representada uh, Esta es la página del presupuesto ciudadano, el proyecto de ley. Acá abajo a la budget. derecha ven la, la sección de right análisis transversal. Eh, en nuestra web de presupuesto abierto hay una website, sección de análisis transversal eh, donde explicamos un poco acá abajo que no analysis, se ve, pero las cuáles son las claves de este análisis transversal orientado a que lo entienda, digamos, alguien que no es experto en presupuesto. Uh, Estamos haciendo análisis transversales en este momento de género, niñez y capacidad. Yendo al tema de género, tenemos una sección donde explicamos If you go to gender, we have this section ya where we explain specifically what we're doing in terms of the gender eh, analysis, and then we publish quarterly what we have done, and the progress achieved, informe, it's uh, published eh, de as a report, más allá and de we basically números, explain the young figures, en este the meaning of such allocations, the, we have the National Directorate director of Economics and Gender, which is a new entity created by the government. It includes a group of experts on gender, and they are the ones that work on this report. So like I said, we have all the reports in the report, as I mentioned earlier, as well as open data. We believe all this is extremely important to empower citizens in terms of monitoring the execution of the different policies and the execution of the budget. Nada, rápidamente, que en la idea de, de automatizar el análisis a través de... Y finalmente, en términos de automatizar... 
aprovechar y poner múltiples dimensiones transversales, como por ejemplo puede ser el enfoque de autonomías de género o algún otro enfoque que se le quiera dar. Eh, básicamente, eso era todo lo que tenía para contar en el tiempo que tuve, pero estoy abierto a preguntas y a... I ran out of time, uh, but if you have any questions, I will happily entertain them. Since we don't have a lot of time left, I think right now I need to commit to something, which is to have another session on gender budgeting in the upcoming weeks. This is a great uh, theme. I think we have very detailed information here and there was a lot left to be shared. So we've been listening to the government. Now we're trying, we're gonna give the floor to Argentina civil society. This issue is uh, extremely important. And it's really part of the national agenda. So I would like to, without further ado, I would like to now offer the floor to Carmen. I'm going to share my screen. And now I will talk about civil society's approach about the things that Gustavo shared and even about all the things like Lorena said, transparency, budget transparency, especially um, the budget that affects, has an impact on women is something that is very important for Argentina. And there is a lot of um, work in that sense from feminist uh, groups in Argentina. To begin my presentation, I would like to start with two things uh, that we say in ESIR. ESIR. We constantly say that budget analysis is a tool that allows us to understand how, when, and how many resources are allocated by the government to guarantee the rights. We work on gender because we need to understand, we want to understand transparency, we need to understand how the budget is guaranteeing such rights. And also we think about rights in a collective manner. So we always work with, in partner with other organizations. We never work in an isolated manner. We always work as a group, and if we can work with the government, even better. Over the last years, we've been working hard so that more activists and organizations can analyze the budget. I know I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the part that has to do with gender. In 2012, we published our, our first uh, guide that had a gender approach, and in 2018, we presented or rather in 2015, we had the first week where we talked about budget and rights. And we also talked about um, results. In 2018, we had a round table with great participation. The room was always too small, too many, there were many participants. We were always running out of time. During the first sessions in ASIG, what we did was uh, talk about public policy analysis, gender organizations were telling us that they wanted to monitor these policies, they wanted to promote them. So we started working with them and then we analyzed uh, the budget uh, regarding those that we found in the budget. One of the things that we said was that we couldn't find all of those policies in the budget. In terms of coordinating with other organizations, and based on such sessions, we could really move forward in terms of fiscal transparency with a gender perspective. And that work and the work that we were doing in terms of reducing inequality. And I think all this is very interesting in terms of gender budgeting. We have to understand this experience from a participatory perspective too. What happened with the gender groups show in Argentina shows us a roadmap that we can use in order to mainstream fiscal transparency and a budget uh, or budget issues in order to guarantee rights, collective rights. We in 2016, 2017, we continued to work with these gender organizations. And in 2018, we started to work on budget analysis. We presented the budget monitor 
Gustavo worked on this and we tried to basically show budget information in a more friendly manner. In 2020, we presented the second edition of the analysis guide uh, of gender budgeting. And also we included an approach uh, about gender violence. In 2016-2017, we could see that the National Plan to Combat Gender Violence um, was not included, w was mentioned, but it was not included in the budget. We had a debate and then those items were included in the budget. When the decree was published with all the items, we saw that it was missing again. We carried out a legal, legal action, we um, mobilized people, and we recovered all those items that were included again in the budget. It's highly monitored by many different stakeholders from civil society, journalists, and so on and so forth. It's one of the items that is always mentioned by the media. In 2018, the government took one step forward and worked on the design of the strategy that we call PPG. Gustavo just talked about it. It continues to get better. In 2019, a gender ministry was created and it has an area that has to do with the budget. And then the budget office, uh, as it was said before, has a very specific responsibility. They started to publish their own reports, which included the gender issue. All those reports were distributed in many different media outlets, including TV channels, which is not very common. In 2020, a bill was presented before Congress in order to formalize all these things we know the Ministry of Finance, and we know because they're doing it in a very participatory manner, they're, the Ministry of Finance is working on improving this strategy. They want to include the LGBTI groups and so on and so forth. They also wanted to bring more visibility to the items that have an impact on other groups. What's missing then? Well, I didn't want to do a presentation where I was just celebrating everything. We wanted to think about the future. We wanted to think about agenda and the roadmap that we had ahead. We started working on a guide for budget analysis uh, and policies against gender violence in, in Argentina. Many policies were left out. We continue to lack transparency in some areas. There are some items that are very opaque and we cannot see what's happening. There are different agencies where they need to uh, show how much they're investing in their policies because it's not clear. It's a big challenge. We need to make requests. We started thinking um, about a new strategy where we could bring some visibility to what we couldn't see in the budget, but from a gender violence approach. This is all I have to share with you. I just wanted to basically say that we had a strategy and we had thought about steps forward. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you. I'm going to give the floor um, to Inesk. I think we're going to have 10 more minutes, but the interpretation services will end at 10, unfortunately. Carmela, you have the floor. We have lost all perspectives of planning, execution, and evaluation of public policies for women. All the accumulation of previous plans, decision taking institutional participation spaces as conferences are being ignored. So I will share some information with you about uh, our budget monitoring and this issue. So in Brazil, the only reliable data we have is from budget because uh, on domestic violence, and the pandemic itself, the existing data is not reliable and the government deliberately tries to hide it. For example, the gender observatory, which was used for government data collection and analysis 
uh, in a partnership with academics and civil society is, not, uh, is no longer functioning. After five years of budget cuts for women, which reached 75% of the budget, uh, the new ministry, the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights, reached uh, uh, in uh, this year with $80 million to execute. Uh, as the minister is a Christian fundamentalist, women's organizations were concerned with how these resources would be implemented. That is, what kind of policies to protect the women were being designed. Uh, this is because the government's multi-annual plan has a very short nar narrative about the policy and excludes targets and indicators. Uh, this is the plan for four years uh, of government. And we were totally in the dark about uh, what they wanted. Also, they changed the name of budget program from promotions of autonomy and confronting violence against women to protect, uh, protection of the family with a subtitle uh, that we can read, protection of the life since the conception. Uh, it's a, a clear attack of um, rights to reproductive uh, and sexual rights. Uh, searching for information, I found, for example, that the reception equipment had changed the guidelines. Um, it's uh, equipment, uh, a service for women that uh, receive the women that uh, is a uh, victim of violence. And these new guidelines um, uh, previews that uh, women will be attended with their aggressors in the same place. Uh, it's the model of the churches uh, to treat the couple and not to protect the women. Uh, last year uh, was available budget, but uh, they didn't spend. So this year we are monitoring. With the arrival of the pandemic, we started the weekly monitoring to identify the resources spending, which went from $10 million uh, to more than $100 million. Of this uh, $100 million, $25 million are earmarked for specific policies for women, but less than 10% was executed by now. This happens in a scenario of flexibilization of contracts and tenders approved by Parliament after the calamity decree published in March. That is, there is no excuse for this low execution. The resource is not reaching the cities and services that victims need. The only uh, budget spent for women in, is the telephone channel for denouncing violence, that is, the public policy door uh, is open, but the reception and protection services are underfunded. So where will these women go after reporting they, their aggressors? Uh, there are about 2 million calls to this channel a year. Meanwhile, the, the minister announced an Amina. information guide to combat violence against women as a policy Amina. against what? Amina. Soy Juan Pablo. Here. Yeah. Dame un segundo para decir que eh, después de... Sorry, just one second to say that after explaining the problems of the Brazilian administration in terms of dealing with uh, gender violence, Carmen's going to talk uh, very specifically about policies that have been in place since the pandemic started, where you also see a very big under execution of the budget, budget in spite of the great need, especially of women experiencing more domestic violence during the pandemic. There's been an increase in reports, but this part of the demand has not been attended. I'm so sorry that I interrupted If we don't have interpretation, in English, most people, yes, because most people will understand. And I will just interrupt you 
for 30 seconds every once in a while. No, we'll, okay. we need to wrap this one up as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Carmela. Okay, yeah. finish, you finish. Know. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, the minister announced an information guide to combat violence against women as a policy against pandemic effects. We know that the most vulnerable women are in no condition to read to such a, a, a material. Uh, many of them are illiterate and very poor. The government has tried in every way to hide public information. So for example, the annual report on domestic violence is no longer published and published reports omit information such as data on policy violence in favelas. Meanwhile, the figures compared by independent researchers show that the pandemic is more fatal for blacks than whites in general and infected black pregnant women die three times more than white women. Because of our colonial heritage, Brazil has 6 million domestic workers, 75% are black. Domestic work has been enacted as an essential service in many states across the country which means that domestic workers are working with no specific laws protecting them in the pandemic, even though bills are pending in Congress. In fact, it's not very evident that uh, the first death of coronavirus in Brazil was a domestic worker who was contaminated at work by her bosses who had traveled to Italy. Last Wednesday, we denounced this situation in the COVID-19 in a special committee in parliament, and we will continue to denounce and monitor the execution of this, this budget. The pandemic will not uh, end in December 31, uh, let alone uh, in, no dom in domestic violence uh, at all. Uh, so I think, Juan Pablo, as you are translating, the most important here is there is a lack of transparency of data about the pandemic, about the domestic violence. Uh, government is trying to hide this. We are trying to do some um, uh, asks for, uh, through the access to information law. Um, and also they are not uh, uh, spending the money that are available. So we are in August and less than 10% was enacted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmela. Sorry, but yeah, I, I've given you all around eight minutes, so. <laughs> Sintetizó eh, Carmela eh, señalando la... Carmela really talked about the difficulty in getting information on this issue with the current government and the conditions are much more adverse for groups that are in poverty and for uh, African descendant minorities who are more linked to domestic service but are also more physically vulnerable to the pandemic and the lack of information and support from the government. <laughs> the uh, so the work has been constantly making reports and denouncing the situation to Congress. Thank you very much. You. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Juan Pablo, for the translation as well. Um, this is a very important topic. Uh, I think we need to do more about this. Uh, Gustavo Perez uh, from OGP, he's going to present us uh, some options on how fiscal openness intersects with open government and how this can be done through national action plans. Gustavo, all yours. Thank you, Lorena, and everyone who's able to stay uh, a little bit. Um, delay on schedule. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just let me know if you can see this uh, properly. Gustavo, nos vas a facilitar mucho la vida si tú mismo en una Gustavo, frase... it will help a lot Perfectamente. if you <laughs> interpret yourself. Yes, eh, trataré de hacer la traducción simultánea. Exacto, por lo menos para los puntos claves. Okay, I'll try to uh, translate at least for the key points. 
Okay, the interpreter Perfecto. is going to the next meeting um, now. Thank you very much. Buenísimo. Well, thank you very much uh, for this space. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of Alison Merchant. Uh, she's the gender specialist at OGP. She wasn't able to make it. Uh, she sends her apologies. I'll do my best to represent. I'm also very excited because I uh, lead the work for assessments of, um, of country performance at OGP, especially for all America's countries as well as Africa. And America's does show, as you've seen today, uh, many of the wonderful experiences of, of how to um, push this topic further. So um, first of all, I'd like to express that fiscal openness is, most, is the most common area of focus at OGP. Uh, nearly one in six OGP commitments release, uh, relates to fiscal openness, and almost every member has made at least one commitment. Um, la transparencia fiscal es de, lo, es de los tópicos más importantes eh, en OGP en el hecho de que uno de cada seis compromisos son, son relacionados con esto. Um, y lo que quisiera hacer ahora es categorizar en qué manera se han traducido estos compromisos en los planes de acción. So I'm going to bro broadly speak about uh, the categories on how commitments are being implemented through uh, action plans. The first broad category is um, this one, which is disclosing gender disaggregated data for better informed policymaking and accountability. Um, this particular example I want to highlight is on Canada. Um, and they, uh, again, this is a fantastic example of how a government has been able to institutionalize as part of the budgetary proce process, uh, gender-based analysis. Um, and I highlight this because what OGP is currently trying to do is connect other countries that are starting the process of, you know, getting the aggregated data uh, published and then see how you can actually make this as part of their budgetary processes. Um, so one of the recommendations that we've had to implement for most of the countries that are trying to work on this uh, on this topic is to disclose gender data, uh, but also specifically state the purpose for the gender disaggregated data that is being sought out and a concrete plan of how it's going to be used and what are the expected results, which is often what we don't find in these action plans. Um, el punto que quiero aquí destacar es que um, Canadá es un buen ejemplo en cómo se ha utilizado la información desagregada sobre género para informar las, eh, la, la creación de presupuestos. Ellos han podido institucionalizar esto como una práctica eh, y lo que en OGP estamos tratando de hacer es eh, prestar este servicio de eh, conectar a otros países que, han, que están apenas empezando en la publicación de información desagregada para que ellos logren eh, incluir dentro de sus compromisos específicamente cuál es el propósito eh, de esta información que se va a desagregar, eh, que se va a presentar, publicar, y luego un plan en cómo va a ser utilizada. El segundo punto que destaco es, eh, o categoría de cómo se están incluyendo este, eh, en, en estos compromisos es en el apoyo a mujeres o e incluso comunidades marginalizadas en los procesos de participación eh, de presupuestarios. Y en este caso destaco Costa de Marfil. Eh, ellos tienen una experiencia interesante en donde incluyeron específicamente un módulo eh, sobre género eh, para capacitar a la sociedad, sociedad civil y también a funcionarios de gobierno eh, en, este, en estos tópicos. Aquí particularmente eh, es importante destacar cómo se dividieron los roles en la capacitación. Hubo un elemento eh, importante que fue la distribución de roles entre gobierno y sociedad civil eh, con objetivos muy claros en cómo se van a llevar cada uno. Um, I'm here pointing out how um, commitments are being used to promote the disclosure of gender, sorry, um, how commitments are being used to support women and marginalized communities to engage in policy making and inform decision making and budgetary processes. Um, particularly, the Ivory Coast commitment is a really good one because they've actually added a module that is tailored specifically on gender issues uh, during budgetary processes. Um, we have actually seen how this commitment, which was the 2016-2018 commitment, uh, it, it led to the capacitation of 300 opinion leaders and, and facilitators, and actually some of the projects that have been voted in directly respond to women's needs, like for example, the construction of maternity centers and the provision of health equipment um, to better serve women um, during pregnancy. So it, it does have, this specific module has actually led to, um, to pro projects that are, that are being actually functioning at the moment. Um, and then finally, uh, the third point I wanted to, or category of commitments that I'd like to, um, to point out is how governments are using OGP to promote access to information on resource allocation, but with the end goal to advance gender equality and inclusion. 
This is much related to the uh, Argentinian case where they're using it on gender, for gender-based uh, violence to tackle the problem of gender-based violence. Um, and here, I'm actually going to point out to Uruguay, their neighbor, because they're also working on something similar, which is an observatory on gender violence uh, to inform budget planning. This is a, um, also a good example because it started in their 2016-2018 action plan uh, when they just committed to publishing information on gender-based violence. Um, specifically geo-referenced geo um, map where you could see which centers provided services for uh, women in these, in these um, uh, that have faced these issues. Um, and they learned uh, and, and created a new commitment in the 2018-2020 action plan where they wanted to actually more specifically um, link this, the, the information being published with uh, the, the, the um, in, uh, budget planning uh, part. So, so here they actually understood that they didn't only have to include the Ministry of Interior, which is the one who implemented the first commitment, but they actually needed the um, Office of Budget and Planning, which led the commission that was implementing this commitment. That was very important. Uh, and also uh, there, the commitment had that specific purpose of creating this observatory to proactively publish information, to give account of the activities and use the public resources and results achieved and use this information to um, co co-designing and co-making the resource allocation and implementation of policies to tackle gender-based uh, violence. And Uruguay, um, since 2015, has you know, in increased its budget uh, spending on this issue in almost 200%. Uh, so as is in Argentina, very important to follow, it is also very important in, in Uruguay. Um, Aquí específicamente lo, lo que quería destacar es cómo se está utilizando los planes de acción para promover el acceso a la información, eh, específicamente en, en, en la formulación de presupuestos, pero con el objetivo de avanzar eh, eh, igualdad e inclusión en temas de género. Y Uruguay es un buen caso, así como también expresaron eh, o nos comentaron de Argentina, en la creación de este observatorio, eh, que es específicamente para velar eh, sobre cómo se está utilizando y planificando el presupuesto llevando a cabo y cuáles son los resultados que se, que, que se ven de la aplicación de, de, de los planes que se incluyen dentro del presupuesto nacional eh, de Uruguay. Eh, y bueno, finalmente entonces los dejo con eh, unas conclusiones generales. Eh, primero, recordar que cuando se quieren hacer eh, uso eh, innovador, digamos, de, de transparencia fiscal y, o datos para la inclusión del tema de género, eh, primero, recordarse que es muy importante que cuando se vaya a publicar información desagregada, que se, in, que se especifique cuál va a ser el mecanismo que va a llevar luego al proceso de toma de decisiones. Eh, continúo en español y luego en inglés. El segundo punto es crear el espacio para la sociedad civil y las organizaciones de, 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 y grupos, eh, por ejemplo, de instituciones que, locales, y asegurar su liderazgo en el apoyo de justamente de los procesos de capacitación a ciudadanos en estos procesos, como por ejemplo hicieron en Costa de Marfil. Y en tercer lugar, eh, recordar siempre utilizar la publicación de, de, de los datos desagregados específicamente para avanzar reformas que se encarguen de promover eh, igualdad de género e inclusión, como el caso de Uruguay. Um, so just to finish up uh, these three main conclusions is to ensure the effective use of gender disaggregated data to inform the decision making and resource allocation. So moving a step further, not just disaggregating data, uh, but actually using it for resource allocation and taking advantage of all the wonderful examples that others have presented, which are in OGP we see as like the panacea, like the, the, what we're, what's currently uh, the best um, attempt to do project, uh, budget uh, processes, uh, gender-based uh, budget processes. So, um, and then the second, to create the space for CSOs and community-based community groups uh, to support these um, processes, budgetary processes as well, um, as they did in Cote d'Ivoire. And then finally, uh, use the publication of disaggregated fiscal data and capacity building efforts as tools to advance specific re reforms on gender equality and inclusion, as they did in Uruguay and are doing as well in Argentina. I'll leave you here uh, for later, but um, just a few quick tits, uh, t uh, bites as well on, on using this information specifically in the current context. I won't delve into this, but I'll leave it as part of the presentation. Thank you, Lorena, and sorry for speeding up as much as I could and with both languages. I hope it was understood. No, actually, thank you for speeding because, you know, this time constraint, I was actually a bit sad when, when I sent out the survey to get what topics were of most interest for the network, gender was on the bottom.
gender was not highlighted. And I was kind of sad about this, but now I see that the interest is here. It was just not in the survey, so please make sure you tell us, because this was such a rich conversation, I would have liked to keep it going. We need to go to the next steps session, and I hope, and here we're telling Juan Pablo, please, on the next step sessions, we can have a working group on gender, <laughs> on gender budgeting. So uh, I, I commit, as in OGP commitments, to, to start this uh, conversation on how we can have some sessions, different sessions, on using the information for activism and from, from civil society, on improving methodologies, for for gender budgeting and better reporting and how we can better include public participation in this intersection with a gender budgeting and intersectionalities of other topics i would like to close this like this uh, but send your send me your questions so that we can draft an agenda on the topic thank you very much for the the presenter uh, to all the presenters thank you andrew gustavo gustavo um carmen carmela and marcela please uh, well i think uh, marcela has has had to go but thank you all and see you on the next session mm -hmm.